Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody who's uh, logged in and uh, you're joining us today for this super exciting event. Uh, joining me for the second time, the second year running that I'm emceeing the, uh, the Pay Fast e commerce performance index, or as we call it, the PEP index. Um, and the reason why I'm happy is because I have a, uh, a very uh, a very stable uh, internet connection after running around the whole morning trying to uh, ward off load shedding and and uh, and get out of my house in Hot Bay where where there was zero internet. Uh, so now I'm in Sea Point, a bright and sunny Sea Point, and I have what I really hope is a very stable connection. I'm told that it's over 200 megabits per second, so it should be okay. Um, so welcome everybody who's logged in already. I'm pretty sure we're going to have a few people joining us as we go. My name is Fred Rode. I'm the CEO of, uh, of Heavy Chef, which is a learning platform for entrepreneurs. And uh, we've partnered with PayFast pretty much from the start of the inception of Heavy Chef. Uh, and um, and very, very proud to be involved in this particular event. Uh, and so we're very excited to hear the results of the, the index report uh, for 2021, which uh, uh, my good friend uh, Colleen Harrison is going to present in a few, a few moments. Just before we begin, um, I'm going to uh, just do a little bit of housekeeping. You'll notice, and already everybody's, I think, gotten the hang of it, that there is a chat function, uh, which will be on the right hand side of your screen. Please do go nuts, uh, um, contribute your thoughts, opinions, feedback, uh, questions and so on um, into the chat. There is also a question facility uh, at the bottom of your screen where it says ask a question and that is for when you would like to ask questions of the panelists themselves, uh, including Colleen Harrison. Uh, Colleen is going to be joined today by three very, very compelling voices in the e-commerce sector. Uh, Warwick Kearns, who is the, uh, the founder and CEO of Insaka E-commerce Learning Academy. Uh, we've got Chris Zietzman from Snapscan. And we have Bronwyn Williams, a good friend of Heavy Chef as well, uh, who is a, a, one of the, the leading future trends analysts in South Africa. And very excited to hear from them a little bit later. Uh, we also have a prize today. So the, um, the prize, as we had last year, is going to be a 5,000 Rand take a lot voucher uh, that will be for the person who comes the closest to answering the question, what was the highest transaction, uh, e-commerce transaction on PayFast over the past 12 months? So what was the highest transaction on uh, on e-commerce transaction uh, on, on PayFast over the last 12 months. And uh, I'll be announcing the winner uh, of, that, of that competition at the end of, at the end of this hour. So um, I, I'm also going to be asking a couple of poll questions of the, of the, uh, the audience today, and, and hopefully we can get some snap surveys uh, in the mix as well whilst we add it. And uh, I do encourage everybody just to get stuck in also to the, the comments and a reminder that at the end of the session, uh, we will also be posting a link to the, the, the survey so that you can download it and, uh, and obviously digest it and, uh, and share it with your colleagues. It's a super fascinating uh, um, uh, survey and uh, I'm pretty sure everyone's going to have fun today. So. Without further ado, I would love to invite uh, my good friend Colleen Harrison from PayFast uh, up into the stage and uh, to share with us what exactly has happened over the past 12 months. Over to you, Colleen. Thanks for that introduction, um, Fred. I'm just going to share some slides. So I'm going to check with Fred. Can you see them? I can, yeah. yes. OK, uh, wonderful. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, cool. So obviously, um, I'm going to take uh, everyone through some just some 
teaser information for the of the index. It's um, quite a comprehensive report, so I'm not going to go through the entire report now. Um, just a little bit of info to get our uh, what do you call it, like our you know juices flowing for a healthy debate and a discussion. Um, so without further ado, let me get started. Um, but actually, before we sorry one sec before we dive into the data of our latest index, I wanted to first reflect on a personal story of overcoming fears of tech innovations and embracing something new. And this title does, has nothing to do with the man in the picture, so I'm happily married, um, but actually with what he's wearing. So I'm not an early adopter by any stretch of the imagination, and I think habits in general are quite hard to change. But I recently went out for a business breakfast and I left my wallet at home, which meant that I couldn't even offer to pay for breakfast. And it might sound like a small thing, but it actually left me feeling quite embarrassed and mortified also working in payments. Like, why am I so dependent on my wallet? And I drove home and I like literally looked at my wrist and I saw my smartwatch and I thought, OK, like a few weeks ago or a few months prior, I actually set up my card on my watch, but I'd never made a payment with it. So I was like, well, why not? You know, that pretty much just boils down to the uncertainty of the unknown and remaining in a comfort zone of what feels normal, um, which up until then was tapping my card. And even pre-COVID, I was literally inserting my card, you know, like the proper old school way. So um, I made a promise to myself, like on that drive home going, I will try to pay with my smartwatch the next time I have the opportunity. And it sounds like an exaggeration, but like the first day that I used my watch to pay, literally, it's changed my life. And I don't pay with anything else anymore. I Most days I actually leave my wallet at home, so I'm quite excited about digital identity and uh, driver's license coming into our lives soon. And it's really about like the convenience and the speed of that experience. But I also like, it's got like a cool factor. Like I just tap my watch and I walk away and I feel super futuristic when I make a payment that way. And why it kind of is pertinent to 2020 and 2021 is that consumer habits have changed. So we know that um, not just with people going online, but also the way they pay offline, where people have been forced to embrace e-commerce as shoppers and as businesses. And uh, many consumers have had to go out of, outside their comfort zones and they've had to try something new which could, for example, be buying groceries online for the first time or order their, ordering their prescription medication for delivery or even using a contactless payment method in order to avoid the, you know, the grimy sort of card machines um, and typing in your PIN. So as we go through some of our findings on the PayFast side, we can see that many changes in consumer behavior brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic have actually changed people's habits for the long term such as my experience with my smartwatch, where I will never go back to how it was. And I had a really nice chat with Chris yesterday, actually. And I love this line where he says, the pandemic provided proof of just how big mobile payments are going to be in future. And it really doesn't matter whether it's wearable tech or a phone and whether it's e-wallets and contactless payments, these are no longer a gimmick. Like they've actually made an impact in our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, in that chat yesterday, um, Chris was also chatting to me about how mobile payments actually have the true potential for displacing cash in the next few years. And like we've had plastic card payments around since uh, around since about the mid 70s, which have brought us closer to a cashless society. But it's really with mobile payments um, that we will, you know, that we will see a space for frictionless payments online and face to face. Um, that make uh, that are going to make cash obsolete in, in in the next little while, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Chris on this topic um, during our Q and A, and what we can expect here in South Africa. Okay, so looking at some of our data, um, our most popular payment methods uh, online continue to be card payments, and what's meant here is like the, the actual card payments where you type in your cardholder details or you have a token stored. Um, on, a, on a merchant website, and these continue to dominate. We see that instant EFT is also still just under a third of all our transactions. Um, but what was really interesting is that QR code payments have managed to carve out quite a significant slice out of our payment method mix, with 3.5% of all payments being made with this 
with a scan to pay option. Um, it still seems like quite a small slice compared to the other payment methods, but it's worth noting that they almost tripled in the last 12 months, so 178% uh, percent increase in this 12-month period, which is off a small base, so lower volumes than obviously the other two payment methods, but it does go to show that the convenience of a mobile payment app is not just for in-store payments, but increasingly also for online transactions. And what makes the second PEP index, as we call it, interesting to see off the back of an unprecedented year last year, is that we saw payment volumes literally doubling from one month to the next. And we now wanted to see, well, what happened, what happened a year down the what happens a year down the line? Will we return to the old normal in terms of online shopping, or have has the change in consumer habits sustained into 2021? Okay, so the answer to that question is that it's most definitely sustained consumer habits. And when we look, so these are our payment, these are our total payment volumes, and we're comparing 20 last year to this year, this 12-month period. And what we can see here is that a step change took place in May 2020. So that's that light blue graph. And that uh, happened when online deliveries of non-essential goods were permitted again after the hard level five lockdown in April. And last year, we spoke a lot about how the growth was more or less sustained several months later. So it kind of plateaus a bit. And even though the lockdown restrictions continue to ease, um, uh, online payment volumes didn't drop to or return to pre-COVID levels. So instead, um, yeah, instead it was uh, it was sustained. But now what we were all waiting to see is what would happen May this year. So one, you know, one when we've caught up on this year of growth. And here it's very interesting to see that the volumes are indicating a pretty healthy year-on-year -year growth rate off of this much higher new lockdown baseline, which is that distance that you see between the light and the dark blue graphs after May. So you can see that there's growth off of that you know, that step change growth. And just if we look at South Africa in general, we know that the total share of online retail sales has increased from 1.4% to 2.8%. So they've doubled. And in that same time, total retail actually dropped by 4.2% because it was obviously a tough economic year. And what we're expecting in 2021 is for the share of online retail to actually rise to 4%, which is so much lower than the global average of 19% but it is indicating a really positive sign for businesses and consumers um, who are now embracing digital transformation as their new norm. And uh, it's, it's a pretty good, you know, it's a pretty rapid growth rate. So I'm sure we'll also catch up soon with, with kind of the rest of the world there. And that latest data that I was referring to is not in the PEP index, actually it comes from Alpha Goldstock and World Wide Works. So how, you know, what contributed to this growth? And it's obviously, um, it's obviously our merchants. And we sent out a survey to just find out about how their business fared. And some of the results were that 25% of all respondents launched an online store in 2021. 50% saw an increase in sales. And that is in 2021 off the back of an unprecedented year last year. And 76% um, their sentiment was overwhelmingly positive about their business and the future. And it's also worth noting here, it's not on the slide, but 87% of the um, respondents had fewer than 10 employees. So we're talking about small businesses here. Um, yeah, small business here, but e-commerce is not just about the business, it's also about the shoppers. And just looking at uh, some of the changes that we see here, it's our demographic analytics of our shoppers checking out on the PayFast engine. And we see that millennials, the 25 to 34 year olds, still do, um, are still the biggest group of online shoppers, but that 65 plus year olds in the last 12 months were our fastest growing group of online shoppers. And we have in the past released data about Gen Z being the fastest growing group, but actually looking at this particular 12 month period, it was uh, the 65 pluses that were the fastest growing and Gen Z is the second fastest. So I think what it speaks to here is that a lot of older people that maybe hadn't transacted online before and were kind of forced into it um, have now also embraced it as something that is convenient and safe. Another trend that we have noticed is that social commerce is increasingly being recognized as a tool for business growth. And of the respondents of our survey, 52% are selling their goods or services within a social media platform. And in South Africa, we, we still don't enjoy the full integration of selling through social channels um, without redirecting to the merchant website. 
So when we talk about social commerce at Payfast, we refer to merchants who have a social media shop uh, for browsing, um, but the transaction is still completed on the Payfast merchant website. And you can also see here that Facebook obviously, obviously dominates, um, closely followed by Instagram and TikTok. I'm sure we'll see some growth in the next 12 months. And now, as we all know, Black Friday is just a few weeks away. And I still find it so weird that Black Friday has taken off the way it has in South Africa. It's grown massively since 2016, year on year. And looking at our payment volumes for 2020, we can see that the transactions start to increase on the Monday before Black Friday and then gradually increasing throughout the week, peaking on Black Friday, which is to be expected. We then see a bit of a dip over the weekend, um, but then another peak for Cyber Monday when a lot of retailers add new deals to their mix and have additional promotions that they hadn't had before. And the important takeout here is that if businesses want to participate in Black Friday, it's critical to think of it as an entire week rather than just a day especially when taking into account where in the week payday falls, um, which obviously changes every year. So this year, for example, payday is the day before Black Friday, which works actually quite well. Um, then on Black Friday itself, we saw that the average basket size increased by 55% uh, compared to the rest of the year, which means that people are spending more per transaction. And payment volume, so the RAND value increased by 47%, and the number of transactions increased by 57% compared to Black Friday 2019. So we do still see this, see this very healthy growth rate year on year for Black Friday. And to put this again into context with physical retailers, they saw some 2 million fewer transactions last year compared to Black Friday 2019. So while we know Black Friday last year uh, was not as big as it maybe could have been if we didn't have you know the, this tough economic year the growth of online sales was still really healthy and that's pretty much it as a brief overview of some of the data that you can expect in the report um, you will be able to download the entire report from the payfast website as well as after this webinar they, they will be a, you know look out for that download link and just as part of this report, in addition to the Payfast data that we collected and the merchant survey, there are also really interesting interviews that we conducted with some of our partners, like Snapscan, Zero, Equit, Time Bank, and many more. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, definitely have a look out for that. And that's all from me for now. Back over to you, Fred. Back. Am I back? Can you hear me, Colleen? Yes. Thank you for that. That was amazing. And uh, I have seen the report, so I'm aware of all the, the trends and, and uh, the, amazing, the amazing insights that have been revealed by the report and also by all the it's amazing how much work has gone into it. So thank you very much for, for that very concise overview. Um, I want to, uh, before I ask you a question, uh, Colleen, I just want to ask our other panelists to, to come up. We've got um, Chris Litzman from, uh, from Snapscan, and we have Warwick uh, Kearns from Insaka, and, um, and we have Bronwyn somewhere in the midst of the, the internet, uh, Bronwyn Wilkins, uh, who's going to join us sometime soon. Um, yeah, there she is. Amazing. So we've got a full house today. I, I want to uh, direct the first question to you, Colleen. First of all, well done on you and the team for putting together yet another really fascinating uh, and insightful uh, index and um, certainly something that's quite useful, particularly for us uh, in the education space. I'm sure Warwick will agree. Um, what surprised you? What what really surprised you about uh, the report and, uh, and and your team, obviously? <laughs> okay, it's an interesting question. Um, I must be honest. What surprised me the most is that when we conducted our partner interviews, and there are there are quite a few of them, is that we were all very aligned in our view of where it's going and what the common trends have been. And it really is contactless and social. So everybody was speaking about it, and I think. Just looking also at our data, that's really where the growth is. So contactless payments, like I mentioned with the QR code payments, um, online as well. 
and and then social commerce we've seen year on year growth there and i think you know once i don't know when that will be but once the social media channels are actually fully integrated it will probably take off in south africa and it was nice to see everybody speaking about it yeah i mean i remember when i used to in a previous life run an agency a digital marketing agency you know in the in the late the noughties and the, the early 10s we used to talk about social commerce as the next big thing, you know, and it was always the next big thing, but it never was the thing. And so it seems to finally be hitting its straps. And um, the other thing that's interesting to me is that back in the day, we often, anyone who was ever in an agency would talk about uh, QR codes and we would put it into every pitch. It's like, hey, use a QR code. And then like, the client would say, well, dude, nobody ever freaking uses these dirty things, you know, they're ridiculous. And so, Chris, I mean, you must be, and your team must be having meetings where you all have bouts of maniacal laughter because you're like, yes, we showed them, right? And so, <laughs> how, how has it been for Snapscan? I mean, some of these insights are just are phenomenal. And um, potentially give us a bit of a view from, from your side of, of the lens and also maybe a little bit about what to expect in the future in, in, in your view. Absolutely. I, I think I, I can certainly confirm that the, the insights within the report are not based on uh, all the individual or independent assessment of what's happening in the market. It's quite clear from the discussions we've had, at least, that the market is really moving into a direction and it's quite clear in, in what direction that is. Um, and so whether it's QR code or other types of, of um, digital payment capabilities, that's where the, the market is, is headed. So um, I think what, what we've just seen is that the consumer has a um, in, in South Africa, at least, a, an affinity towards a quick checkout method and, and QR codes really do provide that like quick checkout on a card. Um, it's really safe because you're shopping from an application that is either your banking app or, or Snapscan or, or something that's similar. Um, and we've got your biometric authentication data. Um, and so whether that's in store or online, um, the, the payment capability and the ability to process it very quickly is is certainly something that's here to stay um, and that's not something that's just uh, going to be on uh, on QR code uh, to Glenn's point you know once a consumer sees what the experience could look like when paying on Apple Pay uh, even if you're not an early adopter uh, you're going to adopt that experience because mobile payments is an arena where you can actually craft the experience for the user or the consumer and that's something you just can't do with a plastic piece of card or with a with a note of cash yeah i, I think it's fascinating from my perspective i just think of my own behavior i mean i've used snapscan i think every single day in the last week you know i hang out at workshop 17 they they it's it's the de facto standard of payments at workshop 17 and um and then i think on friday i i left without paying because <laughs> i kind of live at workshop 17 and so the crew at the cafe whatsapp me a, a photograph of the qr code <laughs> they were like dude hey and it's you know there's no way you can get away with it and it's so convenient i was like damn you know so i kind of got got it up on my my laptop and i took i basically scanned it in and it was done so um I mean, I think the other thing that was mentioned was was social social shopping, and and Bronwyn, I mean, fr from that perspective, you know, social shopping has its has its day come, or or what what do you believe we can still expect uh, from from social shopping? Yeah, so that's quite an interesting one. So I suppose I'll talk to two elements that we definitely see picking up. The one that would be a little bit of a change in the way that we're paying there. What you would have seen over the course of the last few days, let alone the last few months, is how many of our large social network platforms, including big platforms like Reddit, are now starting to adopt things like their own tokens, so based on their own economy. I know many of you would have heard of like Facebook's Libra project that's been rebranded as DM. Those things are all seem to be arriving at around about the same time. And that's something we're going to see take off in 2022, which means that that payment experience becomes something that's very organic to that platform or to that network. 
because even as you're talking about sort of snap scan, that's already sort of a, a different sort of player in the game between your customer and your experience, the sort of integration of social selling to the point that you're actually using the currency of that social network to actually trade value within that sort of almost walled garden is something that we're starting to see like Web3 coming together all over the place. That's a sort of slightly further ahead future trend and it is going to change again the way that we exchange value particularly around things like micropayments and you know, your identity becoming your digital wallets as opposed to your identity being a username and a password or even a credit card, which is quite a big sort of shift to get your head around. But that is coming. I would definitely be looking at that if I was trying to sell anything online. I definitely saw through the report that something like the Facebook is like responsible for something like 92% of those social sales. It would be something we would look at because as soon as those networks adopt their own currencies, they're going to want their players within that within their network to actually use those sorts of currencies. And they're actually going to be sort of cryptocurrencies too. Very interesting. The other thing on the social selling side is how we've seen that evolve. So it's been quite static at the moment. You would set up a Facebook group or like a WhatsApp channel or a or an Instagram page and you would sort of sell to people through there. Then we started seeing those apps developing the sort of pages. So you actually could actually complete that transaction within app. So they've tried to keep you again within that walled garden. I would say this is a precursor towards these networks wanting to develop their own payments and currency systems again. So something to look at there. But from a more sort of interaction and sort of retail trend perspective, we see social selling sort of shifting from being advertising, which it was originally, obviously pay for an ad or to Facebook or whatever. Then we shifted to the influencer thing, which is almost like the digital equivalence of an advertorial. So you kind of made it look like real content, but it was actually somebody that was sort of selling and sort of promoting your wares. But the next sort of shift quite dramatically is from influencers changing into direct salespeople. So we're seeing, and this is a trend that started out in China, but it's moving rapidly, quite rapidly west, and something we get to see quite quickly, particularly with regards to live selling. This is where influencers, instead of being paid to just be pretty or to just be paid as sort of a branding fee, are now paid on sales commission for actually selling your product. This makes sense. Now the customers are used to already paying online, you know, doing that transaction in app. This is the next evolution there. But you can almost see that influencers are using the live chat capability, particularly things like Instagram Live or live TikToks or live YouTube channels to actually almost become like those late night shopping networks, but the digital social media equivalent. To give you an indication of how big this marketplace is, in China, it was there was something like $61 billion worth of sales that took place in influencer live selling sessions from luxury brands all the way through to brands like Walmart and Costco are embracing this trend. And that was in 2019. So this was like before going into COVID. So you can only imagine how much that's increased. I don't have fresh data on that, but I will be looking out for that. But to see how that's trend is sort of moving west, we can see in the US over the last year, there was around $11 billion worth of sales that took place through live selling. That's live streaming services with influencers actually flogging goods directly to their followers. Again, it's quite a big one to look out for. And I'm sure we're going to see that here. We were quite early adopters. In the whole influencer phenomenon anyway sure the, the the lines are getting blurred it's it just feels like everything is being interconnected right and everything just feels like it needs to have a central strategy almost like i've been spoke so everything kind of connects to that central strategy as opposed to kind of picking one thing and then gunning it on that and with those lines being learned it becomes a fairly confusing space to to broach and to enter into and potentially and for some of the I'm sure for some of the people in the audience today um, so, somewhat intimidating and so with that work if you look at you know uh, I mean, let's just say people who are new to the game or who are traditional retailers you know what is your perspective for those those individuals who are, are looking to get into e-commerce who are early or maybe early on in, the, in their journey, what do you advise them on how to approach this brave new world as, as Bronwyn uh, outlined? Yeah, and, and it is a, it's a big gap to, to leap over because um, it, it seems like e-commerce is this place, like the numbers, the stats, the reports are showing that everything's growing, which is exciting, but it's also kind of intimidating. Like, where do you start? And um, thankfully, you know, Fred, you'll agree that education is so important in this journey. and you know, when, for those of us that started selling online 10, 15 years ago, we had time 
to make mistakes and to take ourselves through the, through the learning curve. And everybody who's selling online, whether you're starting today or you've already been selling online for five years, there's a learning curve that you're going through. And an advantage that people have today is to use stats, stats like what are available in the PEP index and education that's available and community support and mentorship and training to accelerate themselves through that learning curve. Because there's something that's different now that wasn't really the case 10, 15 years ago. And the thing that um, is also kind of underpinning the PEP report and all the stats that we're sharing here today is that with the growth, that also comes with more competition. So somebody who's starting today is coming into a far more competitive space. Everybody else is, is doing it also. And, um, and so you have to advance yourself through the learning curve, like lean on the community, look at the PEP index and see where you can uh, spot opportunities or maybe you can pick up something that you've been doing wrong. I went through the index myself with a cup of coffee this morning and there's so much interesting stuff in there. But one thing that just stuck in my mind was that 70% uh, 76 percent of respondents to the survey said that they've um, optimized their site for mobile. And I'm there sitting thinking to myself, like, why is that not 100 percent? What are the other 24 percent of people doing? Because mobile is so important. Mm. I think everybody would agree. And that's just down to education, because if you don't know, then what, how would you know to do it? And so there is education that's available right now, which is so important to accelerate people through that learning curve. And I think that that's just so important that people embrace that. We didn't have that 10, 15 years ago, and now it's available. And as it's a more competitive market, those people who learn quicker and go through that learning curve quicker are going to see more success in a faster time frame. But the one thing that's, that's for sure, from all the stats that are being shared in the index and here on this conversation, it's the one thing that is for sure is that everybody who's watching this, everybody who's downloading the report, you guys are in the exact right place. Like e-commerce is booming and this is such a great industry to be in. I, I couldn't agree more, Warwick. I think, um, um, you know, specifically now going into this period now, we're just going to see fireworks. You know, everybody's gearing up for the, the season. And uh, all of our mates who are in e-commerce are really going through a purple patch. Um, I, with, with Black Friday in mind, I actually want to uh, ask a quick poll to the audience and just bring, uh, bring some of the audience in the mix. And I can see that <laughs> there's lots of wild uh, estimations on, uh, on the highest transaction. Um, Karen van Vag, 2.5 million cheapest. That's a that's a weighty credit card, um, and uh, Lee and Shaw thirty million bucks. That's um, that's fairly fairly sizable. Um, but I do want to ask the question of the audience, just of you guys uh, who are logged in today. Who of you are actually going to be really looking at those Black Friday deals? How important are they to you? So I mean. Are you going to be setting an alarm uh, to, to wake up early <laughs> on Black Friday this year to catch the deals? I'd love to, to hear from you. And, uh, and there's a poll at the bottom of the screen. If you can just click on that and let us know, please. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll ask another question shortly uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But just before we do that, I just want to get the results of that poll. Um, but Warwick, I, I mean, I think you're right. It's extremely exciting. And I think there's, there's definitely this shift. And the, the thing that's particularly interesting to me is that you mentioned mobile. And, and the thing around the user journey with, with consumers now is they've always got their mobile with them, right? Even when they go into an offline setting. So, you know, as Crystal testified, they'll go in, they'll look at a product and use their mobile to make a transaction. Everything as Brandon was alluding to, is becoming blurred. You know, this user journey is no longer what we thought it would be, which is very easily definable, categorizable uh, sectors that you could target individually. There's this very fluid kind of movement throughout. And, and I think what's particularly interesting then is the concept of omnichannel. And, I, you know, this gets bandied around quite a lot. Um, a friend of mine who runs one of the largest uh, e-commerce stores was like, we shouldn't just, we shouldn't call it only, we, sh we should just call it like business because <laughs> it's effectively what it is, right? It's just business. It's like every channel all interlinking. So Colleen, 
with your um, with your marketing hat on, how do you believe that our uh, our vendors, it, you know, can can manage that with these ongoing trends and obviously this this sort of catching up of of uh, the online to the offline environment. How do you feel that our partners and clients and the people within the sector should respond to uh, to this this trend? Um, I just want to first touch on your story because working in marketing in 20, it was in 2010, I always met with these mobile display banner salespeople and I felt so sorry for them because in 2010, it was all experimental. Nobody was throwing budget at it. And every time, every, <laughs> and the way every single meeting ended was always, next year is the year for mobile it always ended like every meeting was like it's next year next year is the year of mobile and the weird thing about that is it wasn't you know there's not a real cutoff like it doesn't go from one year to the next it's not like there's a cut where it just flips uh it's it's so gradual that all of a sudden it is the year of mobile but we don't even know exactly which year that was because it just it just kind of infiltrates and i mean i think we can all agree like warwick said that it is mobile like the you know we know the future of payments is mobile e-commerce is mobile future of tech is mobile whether it is wearable whether it's a phone but um but it kind of just sort of uh, it gradually kind of infiltrates in our everyday lives rather than being like a flip and i think that's why what bronwyn says is so super interesting about the influences because it's probably like a similar thing like it's not something that happens from one year to the next it just kind of becomes part of our lives quite gradually and before we notice it we're only buying from live selling people you know and then the shop becomes obsolete i don't know so um, what advice there would be for merchants is I think you can't be, you know, I know, I know a lot of pay fast merchants, for example, are small businesses. So you're limited for resources, limited for budget, and you need to kind of focus on what works for your business. And, uh, and yeah, and I think um, uh, drawing on networks, like Warwick said, drawing on those learning uh, platforms, drawing, drawing on your network, and educating yourself is gonna go a long way in optimizing your business. So make sure that the business isn't optimized, you know, don't try and be every, everything to everyone, um, but rather see where, where does it make sense for your business to go and then just hone into that direction. It's so funny because when, when I did run the, the, um, the digital agency, you know, we'd always say at the end of the, the sort of pitch document just before pitch day, it's like just add one slide with that QR code strategy in there because even if they don't use it, it just makes you look like you're on the on the cutting edge, you know, like back in 2010 or 2011, like that was the thing, right? If you didn't have the QR code, then you felt like you're a little bit behind. So, um, I mean, Chris, if if we look at uh, there's a question actually from um, uh, from the audience. Um, I'm just going to pull it up here. We've got. Uh, Hank Boyer asked, I think, a, a, a fairly straight up question. Why would consumers prefer SnapScan um, and similar payment methods when that person can just tap and go with a credit card, as, um, as Pauline alluded to? And I, I mean, I think that's an, that's an interesting question, right? Yeah, uh, it's a very fair one at that. Um, and it's certainly uh, something that we're looking at quite closely with, uh, with Apple Pay launching uh, earlier this year. Um, and, and so if, at Snapscan, we, we have to box cleverly. Like we're not going to necessarily beat Apple. Um, I, I mean, we've got a really psyched team and, and they'd love the, <laughs> the challenge, um, but, but we've got to find those like um, examples where Apple just cannot compete with the experience that we want to present our merchants and our consumers. And the, the benefit of, of Snapscan is that you load your, your card into Snapscan once off and you can then use Snapscan however you want. And, and the same applies to a merchant. So a merchant gets a QR code and they get a payment link and they can utilize our capabilities in a way that really suits their business. Um, and that, that I think is um, per, perhaps some advice that uh, anyone who, who wants to go into um, to, to the social kind of commerce that, that Bronwyn's um, described to solve as the very first uh, port of call, like getting paid and getting your, your 
cart converted um, and having a trusted method of conversion for payment is probably the, 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 the foundation of selling, right? Especially in a remote world. So what, what Snapscan and, and mobile payment um, players present is a trusted brand. And um, I think some abilities to tailor uh, for a merchant. So you can send a payment to somebody, they can click on it if, with Snapscan and it will redirect straight into the app. If, if you, you've clicked it, your merchant can see your QR code. They can embed a bunch of data into the QR code, which feeds them back and makes them reconcile transactions um, without having human intervention in it. Um, and so, I think the exciting thing for, for QR payments is still that um, we are true omni-channel. And, and, you know, if you, if you ask anyone, like, what's the def definition of omni-channel, everyone will have a different, uh, a, a different definition, surely. But um, Snapscan and, and QR code and, and other players present the, the ability to pay in omni-channel environments. And I think one example where Apple Pay just won't be able to compete with, with QR code, for example, um, is uh, one of my favorite plant shops, and I've got a bit of a plant buying problem, uh, <laughs> but one of my favorite plant shops in Cape Town is called Fola. Um, and they've recently just started putting some of their stock in coffee shops in and around Cape Town. Um, and they put a QR code uh, on each of those plants. Um, and when you scan it, it gives you the exact price on Snapscan and, and it um, asks you for, for your details and you can pay right there and take the plant home. And, and that brings a different level to our previous understanding of what Omnichannel was, right? So that's kind of taking, taking that uh, ability to put your product into social channels and, and applying that in a brick and mortar environment, which is really interesting. Um, and I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of that. And, if mobile payments keeps evolving at the pace that it is today, um, I think merchants and, and sellers will um, uh, innovate on top of that to, to take the capabilities that mobile payments present and utilize it to the advantage of their businesses. And, and that's the stuff I'm really excited to see. It certainly is exciting. And I think, um, well, look, we've, we're, not, we're definitely not gonna bet against you. And um, I think, uh, uh, if, if we look at the trend of QR codes and how it's just become so prevalent also in, in international uh, regions, it's, it's really become a, a standard. And I think people have just got, gotten over that, that, that hump of not trusting it. Um, I want to quickly touch upon the, uh, I see the polls is very interesting in that 50% of you have Said that they they're not they're, you're not interested in shopping on Fridays, so that's quite interesting. You uh, being I assume most of you who are interested in e-commerce and uh, e-commerce retailers yourselves, that is exceptionally interesting. Um, I have another poll that I want to bring up. Uh, the the poll that I, I want to ask, and somebody else who is probably engaging in maniacal laughter right now is is uh, Marcus from Luna who um, just recently put a big sign on a building, <laughs> one of the tallest buildings in Cape Town, uh, based on the growth of crypto in the last, in the last little while. Um, I want to know which trend do you think is going to see the most growth in 2021? So it'll be buy now, uh, pay later, QR payments, or crypto, blockchain or crypto. And uh, that'll also be quite interesting just to see, see what you guys think. Um, and um, I mean, with that in mind, I think I want to know now with all these shifts that are starting to happen and all these innovative uh, movements across, I mean, across the world really, and not just South Africa, Brandon, if we look at physical retailers, I mean, a couple of years ago, we spoke about this retail apocalypse, you know, where, you know, we, we were going to, we were envisaging scenes of, you know, the Mall of Africa with like tumbleweed across it, across it and so on. I mean, what do you see happening? Well, what is happening? And, and how do you see this, this evolving? How's the story going to play out? 
Well, firstly, I'd say that there is some of that apocalypse taking place. I mean, I live quite close to Northgate Mall, which literally does have tumbleweeds blowing through it. I mean, they they they, they can't even they run out of paper to paper up the empty stores, for example. And we did have some of the largest sort of retail surplus here in South Africa. So this trend has affected us more so than other parts of the world. I mean, I think it, at, at its peak, we had the eighth most retail floor space in the world in South Africa. We do not have the eighth biggest economy by a long shot. So we had far too much shop space. And there's many reasons for this, largely because of the way our economy is growth, premised on growth at all costs, basically. And a lot of that sort of building was actually done because of a lot of the pension funds are actually invested into property. And this sort of thing all has sort of this knock-on effect to want us to sort of build now and then fill later, much like we might be sort of buying now and paying later. The idea is sort of to build them all and then hopefully everyone would come. Unfortunately, we do have quite a lot of ghost space and this has only been accelerated now with the move towards like remote work now. So commercial space, whether it is retail or whether it's office space, is under a lot of pressure. That's not to say that retail is disappearing, but rather that it is becoming a different sort of an animal. People going to malls and to shop spaces for different reasons than they would have before. I mean, Checkers 6060 has completely changed a lot of people's minds with regards to actually having to go to a mall to do the grocery shopping. So what we will start to see is, is our malls, and we do have mall culture here in South Africa quite a lot, moving more towards a sort of high street model of having sort of smaller boutique stores where lots of brands can be in place. And you might say that I'm just sort of talking out the side of my mouth there, that that's not necessarily happening. But one of the trends we've been tracking quite closely over the, the course of the last probably like eight months as the world has sort of come out of lockdowns and all the rest of it, we've noticed something quite interesting where a lot of the mom and pop shops that have invested in online stores to take advantage of the world's shift towards e-commerce are now starting to set up smaller retail spaces. They're actually taking a lot of these learnings from people like retailers, like checkers, who have understood that their retail store can actually be a fulfillment center and actually a piece of marketing for the few people that do want to come in and ship. So this idea of having a physical retail store as an interactive drop shipment center, we kind of terming this trend to be kind of ghost retail, much like we've become familiarized with ghost kitchens, whereby mom and pop shops again, or restaurants are embracing the sort of on delivery, on demand delivery model, taking advantage of all those new sort of delivery drivers with their scooters that are now driving around the system, we're seeing that uh, online retailers are also wanting a bit of that physical presence because there is something to be said about having a physical presence in terms of trust and also in terms of competitive advantage. So unfortunately, most services that are purely digitized can be automated and you've got less of a competitive advantage that you can invest in. So that whole concept of ghost retail stores is something that I probably would be looking at, particularly if you are a smaller e-commerce store. It's a way that smaller retailers, e-retailers, can start to compete a bit against those very big sort of platform-based online retailers like your Amazons and your take lots because they, of course, take a large amount of your margin. If you are a small brand, you want to maintain your margin. So the ghost retailer kind of gives you a bit of both worlds. And what we're seeing there is that smaller brands might be compiling together. And we would have seen some of those sort of store concept stores coming up in like Samson City and down by the VNA waterfront. We've got kind of local brands in quite a nice retail space, but it's a, a shared space among sort of like-minded brands that gives you that bit of a tangible space and also allows you to embrace economies of scale for deliveries of your online stores. So again, those sort of blurring of boundaries between what is what, online, offline, omni-channel, and what you were speaking about earlier with regards to those like QR codes coming through to like social spaces in the physical world, not just in the virtual social space, all sort of taps into that, to finding tangible points, tactile and surprising points to sort of interrupt your customers, but in a good way, in a more physical space, even if you are an online retailer. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. And one thing that's really, really clear is that particularly with the pandemic, we, we're just seeing the ground shifting beneath our feet. And that can be both terrifying as well as exciting. There's so many opportunities to disrupt. I mean, we've got all these, you know, these big retailers that have kind of parked their tanks on the small retailers' lawns. And I think at the end of the day, what this is meaning is that with that shifting of the ground beneath them, that it enables us to look at technologies, uh, these innovative technologies to, to punch up, you know, to punch above their weights. Um, I love the point uh, that Robert Fenter made here. Um, 
QR code payments for your lower lower income adoption to digital payments will be on the rise. And I think that's true. You know, there's there's opportunities to target larger sectors of of the markets. Um, you know, not just for Black Friday. You know, you know, across the board. I do want to touch upon um, Black Friday again, just a little bit, just to kind of give us a sense. Um, as we we um, we've got ten minutes left, and I just want to use the time wisely. I think one of the questions and one of the the topics that is widely broached by our audience is is you know how do you you manage um, uh, how do you approach something like Black Friday? I saw there was a question that I really liked in the Q and A. Um, uh, Brendan asked, "Is there a possibility that Black Friday sales could create distrust in small businesses, as it indicates the margin you could remove whilst making a profit, often large discounts?" Now that's a great question, and I've thought that before. You know, it's like, come on, guys, why can't you just give us all you know those beautiful discounts more often? You know, if you're prepared to do it for one day, like, what's the point? And so, Warwick, I mean, it's a, it's, it's. I mean, I guess it's, a, it's a broad question in, in, in one sense. But if you look at Black Friday, and clearly in this audience, there's a bit of distrust <laughs> um, uh, towards the concept. I mean, how do you advise your learners uh, on approaching seasonal event uh, sectors like, like Black Friday? Um, what, what insights can you provide for us? Yeah, so Brennan's question about trust is actually a really good focus point because um, we should always be thinking about the trust that our website has. Chris mentioned it earlier, and you know, if anybody comes to your site and they find a product that they love and your price is right, but they don't trust the website, they're just not going to buy. So trust is crucial. But to Brennan's question, I would say never be afraid to make a profit. Um, your business exists to make a profit. And as the owner, as a shareholder, that's your responsibility. And if you flip that around and you look at big corporates in South Africa, like, you know, Discovery is making a lot of money, but do you not trust them? Um, profit is part of business. So if you are doing deals and discounts, that could be viewed as one thing, but there's different ways. And like tips and uh, suggestions that we share with our students is around structuring deals that isn't always about the discount. Bundle deals is my favorite way to, to drive sales up. And also to speak to uh, suppliers and see what they need to move out of their warehouse, work with partners, build relationships through this time. Look in your own warehouse or in your own stockpile, in the, box or in the piles of boxes in the corner. Whichever products are gathering dust, use this as an opportunity to turn those boxes back into cash in the bank. And importantly, use Black Friday to build your email list. Build the exposure that you get for your brand so that you can sell to these customers again and again long into the future. So Black Friday is a big promotion, but as I mentioned earlier, it's getting way more competitive than when we first did Black Friday in 2014. Um, so the more competitiveness, it represents more opportunity, but there's multiple goals. We can clear stock, we can turn uh, products back into cash, and we can grow our database. And growing the database, in my opinion, I can talk about this for another hour, but growing the database is so crucial. In fact, I often say that the future growth of your sales of your online store can be determined by the current growth of your email list. So there's multiple ways to approach Black Friday and there's multiple benefits. It's not just about the sales, but you know, Fred, I think that uh, the 50% of people who voted the poll saying that they're not going to be shopping on Black Friday, I got a sneaky suspicion that they're not going to be shopping themselves because they're going to be so busy selling so much stuff on their own online stores. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, one of the things that, that never changes is, and I, I believe this to be true, you know, pre e commerce, but now it's becoming increasingly true is that as a, as a business, you have to build a brand. And if you look at what a brand is and, and um, how you define a brand, essentially, one way of looking at a brand would be, you know, to, to select a message uh, that you choose to convey. And within that message contains a promise. And your your brand lives and dies on whether or not you can keep that promise. You know, and that's, that, it, it, that weaves its way through all these various contrasting channels and all these various, you know, um, opportunities and innovations. That brand, that brand message containing the promise is central to everything that you do. And it's really important that you, you retain the trust 
in that uh, that promise that you're making Absolutely. to your consumer. I think um, I think it's you know whether you're a big business, which obviously where you see promises broken, it has a huge impact on share prices and so on. But as a small business, you know, as you build your community, grow your, your lists, I think it's absolutely crucial that you protect uh, and retain the, the um, you know, the, the trust in your brand. Um, Colleen, as, as we draw to a, a close, I, I want to um, touch upon, uh, you know, many of us uh, within the audience here are, are small, small to medium-sized enterprises. And, and um, I mean, there's a question here um, from Lizelle uh, Olafir. As a new e-commerce store, I'd like to know how to create buyer confidence with a new store. I mean, I think that speaks to that previous question, right? I mean, you, you mm. as PayFast obviously have many, many small businesses within your, your community. How, how should they find themselves being more competitive against the sort of take a lot uh, voucher we're going to give away shortly mm. um, of the world. <laughs> so I think what a lot of people maybe don't know is the origins of PayFast is exactly for that reason. It is to help small businesses gain trust with their customers when making a payment. So PayFast works with a redirect model, which some people may criticize, you know, but there are other options available. If you wanted a, if you wanted a, a white label payment method where it appears like you're still on the merchant website, but at PayFast, actually the value that we provide is that security with the redirect where customers have built up a certain brand trust with the PayFast brand. And they know that when they check out with a PayFast merchant, that they can trust that we have vetted the merchant, that we have, um, you know, I mean, they, you know, they, they will always be, uh, some will probably go through the cracks, but like overall our merchants are extremely well vetted and uh, and just having that pay fast payment gateway is already a huge trust badge for small businesses. So I think that already goes a long way in, in helping customers go over the line. And we've actually, released recently a few tips just on how, you know, what are sort of other ways that you can create uh, trust for new shoppers that haven't checked out with you before. And those are things like offering, um, you know, a money back guarantee or making your refund policy very clear, um, having trust badges around the security of your website. So that's obviously once you've gotten the customer to your store, um, getting your getting your traffic to your website is obviously a whole different, is a whole different matter. So there you would again social media is fantastic and just building communities online getting referrals um advertising on social media is also not that expensive but i think once people are on the website it's very important that you have all the trust badges there to make sure that people know this is a credible site it's been vetted or it's got the correct security certificates and i can you know i can happily browse and check out without needing to worry that my goods won't arrive or that my payment is compromised, like my, my card details or my payment details are compromised. Yeah, it, it was such a fascinating thing to me. It was a small little detail in the report around the trust badges, you know? And I think that's, it's so true. It, it, um, again, it's a philosophical thing, but it's, it's around that thing of trust is, is, it's so important in this world where trust is, is such a highly valued currency, you know? I think just to add to that, you know, just, to, you know, word to everybody who's listening today, just know what you stand for, know what it is that you believe in, and then stick to that, you know, really kind of keep that promise that you make to, to your audience, because it's, it's really in a world where the, you know, the ground is shifting beneath us, it just goes so, so far in, uh, in entrenching and fostering strong relationships with your, uh, your community members. So um, I think with that as a, as a closing message and, and a huge thank you to the PayFast team, you guys, I do know, I mean, I've, I've known Jonathan for many years and I do know that trust is definitely at the center of your DNA and something that you guys are, have been working furiously at, at, uh, at building and growing and, and become one of the, the most trusted brands in the continent. First of all, massive congratulations to you, Colleen, and your team uh, for all the hard work behind the scenes. I know that it's, uh, you made it look easy, but it's obviously a lot of hard, harder 
uh, harder than what it seems. Uh, a huge thank you to my esteemed panelists, uh, Chris Warwick and Brian. So good to see you guys um, and hopefully see you offline at some point. And most of all, a huge thank you to the audience uh, for participating and having such a lively discussion on the side there. It's quite something seeing all the, the, the chat flashing and beeping as you're trying to, <laughs> trying to concentrate in the conversation. Um, and, uh, and thank you for participating in the polls. I'm pretty sure that uh, Marcus Sonipal will not be happy to see the result of the poll, which basically is, uh, is putting crypto <laughs> at the bottom <laughs> of the pile in terms of trends, upcoming trends to watch out for. Um, and then just before we, we sign out, I just want to check my messages here to see who the winner of the 5,000 Rand Take A Lot voucher is. Um, it is uh, Iman Noor with 375,000 Rand, which if I remember correctly, I'm just going to see if I can get my notes. Um, I believe that that was pretty much bang on. Um, I'm just going to try and get that up. Uh, yeah, anyway, it was uh, 372,600 Rand was the, the highest transaction uh, in the last 12 months. So well done to Iman Noor. We will be in touch with you, sir, and, uh, and, uh, and you will be getting your take a look voucher just in time for, for Black Friday. Um, and a huge thank you to Missing Link behind the scenes. Keegan, you've done a bang up job as per usual. Well done, sir. And uh, lastly from me, just to say that we will be posting the link to, um, to download the, uh, the 2021 edition of the PayFast e-commerce performance index. Uh, and I see that it has just gone at the little green button at the bottom of the screen. Everybody. Uh, have an amazing Wednesday. Hopefully that you will use the time uh, load shedding uh, spent wisely with your loved ones or out in nature and uh, or potentially uh, putting up some notes for how you're going to change the world. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next year, same time. Take care.